Sugar is back. And this time, it's being called a metabolism booster. Influencers are slamming hundreds of grams of sugar per day whilst restricting protein. And they're actually reporting weight loss, improved energy, and workout performance. This is my breakfast. I had some Sour Patch Kids, Starburst, jelly beans, eight ounces of apple juice. Sugar on the bottom, sugar on the top. Sugar. But before you start pounding bags of Skittles and expecting your six pack to pop out, here's the harsh truth behind this so-called sugar diet and why this viral trend might be more of an insulin spike than science. For those of you that have been living under a rock, let's first get you up to speed. This diet itself is defined as eating low protein, low fat, and lots of carbs. For example, there's this guy by the name of Mark Bell who is having half a gram per pound of body weight, so approximately 100 grams, at 209 pounds of protein, which is very low less than 30 grams of fat and eating as much as 800 grams of carbohydrates in a day. If we use these numbers, he's eating approximately 3,900 calories, 83% of which come from carbohydrates. He is also including sugar fasts on top of this, where for days at a time, he will only consume these six foods, fruit, fruit juice, maple syrup, honey, sugar, and candy. But he's reporting weight loss and fat loss with others reporting similar. So should you believe him or is he just lying on behalf of Big Jelly Bean? Let's first discuss some important data, particularly why these influencers think that the sugar diet is working for them. It all comes down to this molecule by the name of FGF21. Now, what exactly are people claiming about FGF21? So FGF21 is a messenger molecule. And what happens is when you consume pure sucrose, not starches, but pure sucrose, like literal sugar, it activates this molecule and it actually revs up the metabolism significantly. There are multiple studies that demonstrate that when FGF21 is elevated, it ramps up energy expenditure. There's a whole lot of reasons why that might be. FGF21 is supposedly uh, at the helm, kind of running the show and helping the body to rev up the metabolism. You can Google that, you can look it up, you can find some YouTube videos on it. What's wild is how obsessed we've become with niche buzzwords like FGF21, whilst ignoring the basics that actually drive fat loss. It's the same story every time. Remember when keto took over the internet, everyone was chasing ketones, guzzling butter coffee and measuring blood BHB levels like it was the holy grail, whilst forgetting that fat loss ultimately comes down to being in a calorie deficit. Now, the pendulum has swung completely the other way and sugar's being sold as the secret metabolic hack. But here's the irony. Both extremes are focused on niche biochemical pathways as opposed to the fundamentals. Whether you're spiking FGF21 with sugar or chasing ketosis by having a high fat diet, the biology doesn't override the basic math. Energy in versus energy out. Anyway, I digress. Let's review the paper that caused all of this hype. It's a paper that was published in Nature this year termed Dietary Protein Restriction Elevated FGF21 Levels and Energy Requirements to Maintain Body Weight in Lean Men. Let's look at what the study was saying, not what the internet is concluding. The researchers set out to examine the effects of protein restriction, not sugar loading. In their design, participants were fed a low-protein, high-carbohydrate diet and their FGF21 levels increased and their energy expenditure also appeared to go up. But the key variable here wasn't sugar. It was the lack of protein. When those same participants switched back to a high-protein diet, 
FGF21 levels dropped and energy intake normalized. That's a crucial distinction. This was a controlled manipulation of protein content, not some celebration of sugar as a metabolic accelerator. And here's where the sugar diet narrative really collapses. The researchers repeated the experiment using a low protein, high fat diet. And guess what? The same increase in FGF21 was observed. And just like before, switching back to a high protein, low fat diet reversed the effect. This means it didn't matter whether the rest of the diet was fat or sugar. The common trigger was low protein. The authors never claimed and their data never suggested that sugar uniquely stimulates FGF21. Yet that's the cherry picked headline driving this trend. This wasn't a study about sugar being special. It was a study about what happens when you restrict protein intake. So now the question becomes what's better for fat loss? A high protein diet or a low protein one? Because if FGF21 spikes when protein is restricted, does that mean low protein is the way to go? Before we dive into the broader research on this, it's worth pausing to examine some of the significant limitations of this study that everyone's quoting. And trust me, there are quite a few major ones that change how we should interpret these results. The study only included eight participants each of whom were young, lean, healthy men. No women, no adults, no one with obesity, and certainly no metabolic diversity. This makes the findings of this study very hard to generalize to the broader population. In scientific circles, we say that it restricts the external validity of the study. Secondly, the intervention lasted just five weeks, and that's a major limitation. Five weeks is barely enough time to observe meaningful shifts in body composition, let alone assess for sustainable fat loss, appetite regulation, or how the body might adapt metabolically over time. Most real world diets take months, if not years, to show their true effects. For example, someone might initially see a bump in energy expenditure or changes in hunger hormones during the first few weeks of a diet, only for those effects to plateau or even reverse as the body adapts. We also have no idea what the long-term effects of protein restriction on your body composition may be. Another big limitation is how they measured energy expenditure. And this is critical because the entire hype around this study hinges on the idea that metabolism was somehow boosted. The researchers didn't use gold standard tools like double labeled water, which tracks total energy expenditure over multiple days in real world conditions. Instead, they relied mainly on indirect calorimetry, a lab-based method that measures oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide production, but only in short windows, usually while the subject is resting or sitting after a meal. That means they were only taking snapshot metabolic responses, particularly post-prandially or after eating, not what's happening across 24 hours of real life. So while they observed an increase in energy expenditure after low protein meals, that doesn't necessarily translate to a sustained increase in daily calorie burn, let alone meaningful fat loss. And this is where we need to bring it back to real world relevance. Because remember, both arms of the study were eucaloric. That means both the high protein and low protein diet had calories equated. But here's the thing, in everyday life, people don't eat in tightly controlled laboratory settings. Appetite and food choices drive caloric intake and protein plays a huge role in that. It's been well established that protein increases satiety to a greater extent than carbohydrates or fat and may facilitate a reduction in energy consumption under ad libitum which means eat what you want, dietary conditions. 
Also, whilst we are on the topic of mechanisms, protein increases thermogenesis, which influences satiety and augments energy expenditure. Finally, protein maintains fat-free mass. Remember, we are not trying to lose weight, we are trying to lose body fat. In contrast, sugar does the exact opposite. It's highly palatable, rapidly absorbed, and stimulates reward pathways in the brain comparable in magnitude to those induced by addictive drugs. The more you have, the more you want, not less. So the idea that eating more sugar will help regulate your appetite or lose fat is not just unproven, it's backwards. If protein helps you stop eating, sugar makes you want to keep going. So now let's take a step back and look at the totality of the evidence, not just one mechanistic study with eight lean guys in a lab. Here's a systematic review and meta-analysis titled Higher vs. Lower Protein Diets on Health Outcomes. This isn't just some small experimental trial, it pulled data from 111 articles across 74 individual studies, covering thousands of participants across different populations, ages, and health statuses. In other words, this is the comprehensive real-world evidence that tells us what happens when people follow high-protein versus low-protein diets, not just what happens to one hormone in a tightly controlled lab experiment. What you're looking at here is a forest plot from that massive meta-analysis. Each point represents the effect of a high-protein diet on a specific health outcome. If the square is to the left of the vertical line, it means the higher-protein diet reduced that outcome. If it's to the right, it increased it. So what does this tell us? Quite a lot. Higher-protein intake significantly reduced weight. BMI, waist circumference, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, triglycerides, fasting glucose, and fasting insulin, all of which are major markers of metabolic health. On the flip side, it increased HDL, the quote-unquote good cholesterol, and boosted satiety, meaning people felt fuller for longer. Importantly, there was no adverse effect on LDL or total cholesterol. So while some are cherry-picking FGF21 from an eight-person study, this is what the full body of evidence shows. Higher protein consistently improves body composition, metabolic health, and appetite control. So if the science doesn't back it, why is this diet working for some people? To answer that, we need to look carefully at the people pushing it. The loudest voice in the space is Mark Bell, a well-known powerlifter who is open about using copious amounts of exogenous supplementation. Insulin, growth hormone, testosterone, trenbolone, anadrol, anavar, dianabol. I've tried a little bit of everything in terms of performance enhancing drugs. And that's a game changer. If you're taking TRT or anabolic steroids, you're not subject to the same hormonal consequences as a natural lifter. A diet that's low in fat, which suppresses natural testosterone production, or low in protein, which may reduce muscle protein synthesis, won't have the same effect when you're artificially injecting testosterone. In other words, his body is pharmacologically protected from the negative effects of a bad diet. But if you're a natural, drug-free individual, those consequences will catch up to you. You can't compare your physiology to someone running on exogenous hormones. Let's also discuss what you're seeing online. Videos like, I tried the sugar diet for a week, or my seven-day sugar diet transformation. These are designed to be attention-grabbing, not scientifically rigorous. Hello, my friends. This video is all about the sugar diet because that's what I've been doing for the past seven days. In only seven days, I ate this entire two pound bag of sugar, plus maple syrup, honey, fruit juices, dried fruit, so much sugar. Anyone can drop a little bit of water weight or feel different after a few days of eating in a new way. 
that doesn't make it effective or healthy. It just makes it good for clicks. The issue is that these people take short-term reactions and start making long-term claims based on zero evidence. And ironically, this mirrors the study used to support the sugar diet. It lasted just five weeks in lean, healthy men under strict lab control. Like the video, it shows short-term shifts, not what happens to your metabolism, muscle mass or hormones over time. It's a snapshot dressed up as a solution. So before you fall for the latest sugar fueled shortcut remember short-term hype doesn't equal long-term health if you want a healthy sustainable diet that aligns with your goals check out this video i made breaking it all down this is the truth